Over the past three months, foreign central banks have put 63% of their new cash purchases into euros and yen, and not into the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar still accounts for 62% of the world's foreign currency reserves at foreign central banks. But for how long? India just purchased 200 metric tons of gold from the IMF for $6.7 billion dollars in order to diversify their reserves away from the U.S. dollar. How low will the U.S. dollar fall and how high will gold rise when more central banks diversify out of dollars and into gold, despite China boosting its gold reserves by 76% since 2003, gold still only accounts for 1.5% of China's foreign currency reserves. Yet, China still owns 1.6 trillion in U.S. dollar reserves. Most telling of all, China is now encouraging their citizens to invest in silver and will be offering silver for sale at banks in China. State's first ever investment opportunity for silver bullion. The bars are available in 500 grams, 1 kilogram, 2 kilograms, and 5 kilograms with a purity of 99.9%. .9%. Figures show that gold was 50 times more extensive than silver in 2007. But now that figures has reached over 70 times, the highest in the past five years. Analysts say that silver has been undervalued in recent years. They add that the metal is a wise investment for individual investors and could be a good way to cash in. We are the first to offer silver bullion as an investment opportunity. The price for the first batch of the bullion is set very low, close to the cost of the raw material. The investment threshold is not high and it is more suitable for the general public. Silver is much cheaper than gold. While the U.S. saw positive GDP growth last quarter, and Bernanke called the recession very likely over, consumer spending now accounts for 71% of our GDP compared to the long-term average of 65%. This means our economy is actually weakening underneath the surface. In order for our economy to truly recover, we need to switch from being a nation of consumers to a nation of producers. But in order for the U.S. to once again begin producing goods to export to the rest of the world, we need Americans to increase savings. In late 2008, early 2009, after the U.S. financial markets collapsed, the first instinct of Americans was to start saving. While initially the American savings rate tripled to a high in May of 6.2%, after the government's artificial stimulus took effect, the savings rate plummeted in half back down to 3%. The free market was trying desperately to get our economy headed in the right direction, but the government destroyed any progress that was made. 42% of the phony GDP growth we saw last quarter came from the government's destructive cash for clunkers program. And so here's a car that people own that they were driving without any payments. They didn't have any car loans on these clunkers. They owned them. Let's destroy that. Let's give you $4,500 to pour acid on the, on the engine so it'll never work. And then we'll pay money to scrap it and all that. Who knows what it costs to actually get rid of each of these working cars. And let's encourage you to go buy a brand new car that you can't afford. And you're going to go into debt to do it. So now every month you have to make a car payment that you didn't have before. This is great. This is really how to get out of a recession, right? Shoot, it's like it's like we got shot in the arm, and so the solution is, well, let's shoot ourselves in the foot too. Cash for Clunkers was a Chinese program because they would not take our U.S. dollars for their exports. We had to send them a bunch of metal and steel for them to give any type of credit to the U.S. A lot of people don't realize that. That was a brainchild of the Chinese embassy, not the U.S. Cash for Clunkers isn't the government's only wasteful new program. They recently extended the home buyer's tax rebate, which credits a first-time home buyer or somebody who hasn't owned a home in three years $8,000 for buying a house. They are also giving out $6,500 to those who lived in their prior home for five years or more and now wish to buy a new home. Not only that, but if you can't afford to pay your mortgage, 
the government is now going to allow you to rent your home from Fannie Mae at a reduced rate in a new deed for lease program. The home buyer's tax rebate and deed for lease programs are designed to create artificial demand for houses and keep housing inventory off of the market. This is creating the false signal that the real estate market has bottomed and now is a good time to buy real estate. Unfortunately, Americans who buy real estate at this time will get slaughtered. The average U.S. home currently costs 20,000 ounces of silver. The last time the Federal Reserve rapidly increased its money supply back in the 1970s, we saw home prices fall from 20,000 ounces of silver down to a low of 2,000 ounces of silver. The bottom line is, if you invest in silver today instead of real estate, you might be able to afford a house 10 times nicer in 5 to 10 years. Most Americans today believe dollars are a safe asset because it has a number on it that always stays the same. While gold and silver's nominal prices can sometimes be very volatile, what's going to happen to the dollar when Americans wake up and realize it is actually the riskiest asset of all. Americans have come to accept inflation as being normal. They've learned from their parents that it was only 60 years ago when it cost five cents for a glass bottle of Coke, five cents for a pack of baseball cards, five cents for a Hershey chocolate bar, 15 cents for a burger at McDonald's, 16 cents for Kellogg's cornflakes, and 50 cents for a movie ticket. But they see nothing wrong with this because inflation occurred over a long period of time. It took 25 years for our national debt to double from $257 billion in 1950 to over $533 billion in 1975. Most recently, our national debt has more than doubled from $5.8 trillion in 2001 to its current level of over $12 trillion in just eight years. Our national debt is now growing three times faster than it did decades ago, which means we should expect a very minimum of three times faster inflation. Therefore, if it took 60 years for a movie ticket price to rise from 50 cents to $7.50, it will most certainly rise to at least $112.50 within the next 20 years. And that's a best case scenario. Americans may not see much price inflation today because major US banks are currently hoarding $860 billion in excess reserves. Congress passed legislation in late 2008 allowing the Federal Reserve to pay interest on the reserves banks keep parked at the Fed. However, as some of these banks begin to make loans, price inflation will increase to a level that is higher than the interest they collect. This will force the other banks to also make loans, and we will see a huge flood of dollars entering the system all at once. I heard you uh, talk about you use pricing as, as a reference, and that uh, purely printing more money doesn't cause inflation, which was really new news to me. And I wonder if you tell me what you think causes inflation. Well, let, let's be clear what's, what's going on. Um, the Federal Reserve is not putting money out in, into, the, into the economy. What we're doing is we're creating bank reserves. That's money that the banks hold with the Fed. So it's just sitting there idly. It's not chasing any goods. Okay? So as long as those bank reserves are sitting idly, broader measures of money that measure the circulation but, of money. But it, but it won't sit there idly forever. The right, purpose exactly. of it is not to sit there idly forever. And, right. and, and, and while there may be a time lapse, certainly, unless that money gets sucked back in uh, exactly. and out of circulation, it's going to cause inflation. There's no denying it. If it's it. not sucked back in, but as I was describing, we have ways of sucking it back in. We How? Have of, well, one way to do it is by raising, interest, raising the interest rate we pay on those reserves, which induces banks to keep the money with us instead of lending it out or circulating it through the economy. To counteract the inflation of the 1970s, the Federal Reserve needed to raise interest rates in 1980 to 21.5 percent. 